Right. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the HRC speaker series. Also, happy Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Christina Stancho, and I'm the director of the Humanities Research Center at BCU. And I'm delighted to welcome you today, um, and I encourage you to check our entire series of virtual events um, this semester organized around the theme race, ethnicity, and social justice. For their help behind the scenes, I'd like to thank Tyler Conrad and Alexis Fink in the College of Humanities and Sciences, and also many thanks to the alumni in the audience, the students, the staff and faculty for their continued support of the Humanities Research Center. Um, and if you're interested in our monthly newsletter, just in case you're not receiving it, please let us know and we'll send you the link. Today's event is co-sponsored by the VCU Department of English and the School of World Studies. And I would like to, to thank the chairs of those units, Dr. Catherine Gracia and Dr. Amy Rector for their support. If you are new to our speaker series, our format is pretty basic. Um, this is the usual format of our speaker events. First, I introduce our guest who will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions from the audience. And I'd like you to please use the Q&A function to post your questions during the talk at the end. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to moderate that part of the discussion. Um, now, on to the good part. I am very thrilled to welcome to VCU Professor Christopher Gonzalez, who is visiting us virtually from Utah State University in Logan, Utah. I met Professor Gonzalez many years ago at a MALIS conference, and this is our main organization for the study of multi-ethnic literatures in the United States, where Professor Gonzalez served recently as vice president and probably will serve as president in the future. At Utah State, Dr. Gonzalez is Professor of English, founder and director of the Latinx Cultural Center and associate dean in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. He is the author, co-author, and editor of six published and two forthcoming books, including the recent winner of the International Latino Book Award called A Real La Latinx, Representation in U.S. Film and TV. Professor Gonzalez works at the intersection of several fields, including Latinx studies, narrative theory, film studies, and comic studies. With Professor Frederick Luis Aldama, he has edited several books, including Latinx Studies, The Key Concepts, published in 2018, An Accessible Guide to the Central Concepts and Issues that Inform Latinx Studies Globally, and Graphic Borders, Latino Comic Books, Past, Present, and Future, published in 2016, which offers an exploration of comics by and about Latinos. An avid sports fan, Dr. Gonzalez also wrote a book on the subject, Latinos in the End Zone, Conversations on the Brown Color Line in the NFL, published in 2013, uh, which offers a thought-provoking conversation on the history of Latinos in the Pro Football League. His 2017 monograph, Permiss Permissible Narratives, The Promise of Latino-Latina Literature, was published by the Ohio State University Press and examines uh, Latinx authors such as Oscar Zeta Costa, Gloria Anzaldúa, Piri Thomas, Janina Brashi, um, Gilbert Hernandez, Sandra Cisneros, and Juno Diaz to highlight the difficulties Latinx writers face in writing beyond the narrow expectations of US readership. Besides being a prolific scholar, Dr. Gonzalez is also a very generous colleague in the field and a terrific mentor to both students and faculty. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you to VCU today, Dean Gonzalez. On to you. Uh, Christina, thank you for that just overwhelming uh, introduction. Um, I'm very pleased and delighted to be here tonight uh, joining you uh, from Utah. I uh, wish I could be there, but times are what they are. Um, uh, and yeah, and I also would like to thank, uh, of course, uh, the Humanities Research Center there at VCU, um, the College of Humanities and Sciences, uh, and the other co-sponsors, uh, Tyler and others who made this event possible. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm now going to share my screen because I have some visuals that might help um, 
uh, help you follow along my talk. Um, let me get this up here. And away we go. So, um, so I wear several hats um, here at Utah State University, as Christina had mentioned. Uh, I'm a professor of English and and for me, that means uh, I'm interested in storytelling uh, by and about um, marginalized communities in the United States, and in particular, uh, Latinx community of writers and readers and people uh, within the community who have specific experiences and, and, and how those experiences, whether real or imagined, are uh, kind of put through the sieve of narrative. Um, and I, and I'm also the, you know, an associate dean and the associate dean of graduate studies at, um, in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences here. Uh, and, and I'm also uh, uh, the founding director of the Latinx Cultural Center here. So, um, so my talk was actually, at times I'll be, I'll be switching hats. At times I'll be talking about um, uh, literary uh, considerations. Sometimes I'll be talking about demographic um, considerations. I'll be talking about uh, things such as um, Latinx students uh, at, in, 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 in education at the high school and in the post-secondary arena. Uh, so I'm going to you know, try to weave all of these things together and hopefully um, reveal to you or at least reinforce the idea that all of these things are connected. Uh, often, um, we who are engaged in the pursuits of understanding literature uh, in this kind of uh, large uh, kind of umbrella term known as English, um, which is a problematic term, but nevertheless, um, we're, 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 we often hear that um, why, why, sh why should a student pursue a degree in English? Uh, as if it's not a worthwhile or or important endeavor, and so tonight I I hope I can um, reinforce the idea that the study of storytelling, the study of narratives, is is intricately linked to who we are as a nation and who we are as a species, um, and so uh, I hope to to. Um, to have a have a wonderful time here with you and I look forward to your questions at the end. So my title is Latinx Precarity, Permissibility and Persistence. So I begin with a question uh, and the question is why should anyone care about the Latina, Latino, Latinx demographic in the United States? I often hear um, some folks say well that that might be an important thing but I'm not Latino. I'm not a Latina, I don't know any Latinos, Latinas, so therefore it's really not my problem. And this is a this is the kind of assertion that we hear a lot when we're confronted with um, the, the needs and demands of underrepresented groups. Often people who inhabit the dominant uh, uh, majority group might, might ask this question, you know, you know, why should I care about this? Well, Here's the answer, and here's here's my thesis tonight. This I I, I didn't want to keep you in suspense, so I've, I've come right out to say that the future of the United States is inexorably tied to what happens to the Latinx community in the past, present, and future. It, it is uh, we, we you, you just cannot get around it. And so the first part of my talk, I'm going to try to establish some facts, uh, kind of ground this in 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 numbers. Um, it's always a scary thing for someone who is a literary scholar, but it's easy enough because other other um, other experts have crunched the numbers for me. Um, so let's start there, right? So this is this is my assertion that no matter what you think or what you believe, uh, you should be concerned and you should be invested in the idea of the Latinx community writ large in this nation. So uh, I'm gonna kind of go through some of these numbers. Uh, this, is, this is from the Pew Research Center, so this is easy to find. Um, and so let's kind of go through this. This is, this is, these, are the, uh, these are the data that, um, that were revealed uh, in the 2020 
uh, census, and we're still, you know, kind of crunching some of those numbers and uh, and the implications thereof. So we're um, in 2020. We have 62.1 million of uh, people in the United States who identify as Latinx. That is a 23 percent increase in 10 years. Uh, it is a that is a staggering number, and as you'll see in a moment, that there is no sense that that number will abate. Uh, it's 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 not going anywhere. And I'll talk about the implications of this in just a moment, but I want you just kind of to just set the stage. Like we're just talking raw numbers here. So um, Latinxes comprise more than half of the entire U.S. population growth in 10 years. So if we're looking at the national population in a 10-year span, that number, half of it, over half of it are Latinos. It, it, that, that again is a staggering number and it's a number that's not going away. It's not going to abate anytime soon. So just the raw numbers there, more than 11.6 million out of a total growth of 22.7 million. Um, incidentally, the majority group, which is identified as white, that, that demographic actually declined. So it had a decline from 10 years, from 2010 to 2020 in over 5 million. And that's less than zero, right? It's, it is a, it is a, less than zero growth, I should say. So it's actually receding. Um, and I'll just stop uh, momentarily just to say and to point out where, you know, I'm at a university, many of you are connected to a university in some way, shape or form. Um, we're talking about a demographic that's growing uh, and another demographic that's getting smaller. And if, you consider that that your university and my university right now are predominantly white students, that demographic is shrinking. And so at some point, there's going to be a critical mass where, where universities, and many are doing this already, many universities that are not accustomed to thinking about Latinx uh, uh, students as a significant or perhaps reliable portion of their student body that is going to that has to change because that that part of the uh, of the pie, as it were, is going to continue to get bigger, um, and it's and it's it's a challenge. So this is this is what makes it, I think, interesting for us here tonight. So as I say there, um, when we look at the growth nationally, you'll see that um, the the states that have kind of like the lowest percentage of Latinx people. Uh, are states like Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota. So they have kind of the lowest overall percentages. Also like um, New England, right? So like Maine, uh, Vermont also has kind of like, just raw numbers are kind of small compared to states like Texas and California, of course. However, what I found interesting is that these states also, even though they're, they don't have a lot of Latinos right now, within that 10 year span, they had the fastest growth of Latinx peoples. So even though it seems like they're like, why would anyone think about creating a Latinx cultural center at North Dakota State University, perhaps, right? That, that could potentially be an argument there. Well, those, those numbers are growing and they're gonna to continue to keep growing. And it's the same argument that I made before. Um, universities will have to um, recognize that more and more of their potential students are going to come from um, this particular demographic. Um, so what's driving the increase? I think this is really uh, important to talk about because it, I think it helps um, kind of destabilize and perhaps eradicate like um, notions that, you know, or, or kind of like understandings of the Latinx demographic that are erroneous um, or that they no longer hold, right? Which is, and that in particular is what's driving these increases in, in, in the nation. Um, Latinos are having families. They're having children here. These are US born uh, citizens that are of Latinx heritage. That's what's driving the increases. It's not often what we hear uh, on, um, you know, on certain political kind of news organizations and programs that somehow it's like these so-called illegal immigrants who are the reason that we're having so many Latinos here. That is not, that is no longer the case. Those numbers are actually going down. But it's not really what you hear uh, kind of on these nightly, you know, talking head shows, which is, 
you know, they, they always often want to propagate fear and saying, oh, our borders are being overrun. Um, all, all, of, all of these Latinxes who are probably illegally voting are, you know, kind of just kind of coming over the border and the numbers are out. Well, it's a, that's actually um, just like a, a, a sheer fabrication. Um, that is, there's no longer the case. At one time, uh, decades ago, um, these increases were due to immigration, um, but that is, there's no longer the case. So we're seeing Latinxes in the United States who are here or having families here. And so um, that's, that's also, and since we're, I, I'm, I kind of, I'm looking at this through the context of the university, more children are, are being born in Latinx families. And those kids at some point will be confronted with the choice of whether they should go to university or not, right? So this is, again, this is a, this is a very prescient issue for our time here at the university. Um, interestingly, Latinos who speak fluently, uh, who, who, sorry, who, I forgot a word there, who speak English fluently, fluent English, went from 59% to now 72% of all Latinxes in the United States that were accounted for in the census speak fluent English. Again, it kind of, you know, kind of um, speaks to the kind of the false narrative that Latinos, you know, often cannot speak English or they don't understand English or they're, they're hesitant to, to speak English. That's not the case. Uh, quite often they're bilingual as we know. And one thing I didn't include here that the data suggests is that more and more of these families and these children who are being born in these families are speaking English at home. So that's a different problem. It's a cultural issue. Uh, and it's a fear of losing one's kind of native tongue. Um, but but that's, that's showing up in, in the uh, data as well. Uh, Latinos over 25 years old with some college rose from 36 to 42%. There, this demographic is, is starting to have more opportunity to go back to university or, or, or to go, you know, as a kind of a non-traditional student. So these are uh, certainly, um, you know, they have, they have, has really important implications for what we're talking about. Um, and this is, this is, this is fresh data here. This is striking. Four in five Latinxes are U.S. citizens. Again, it speaks against, or kind of like, is, it runs contrary to this myth that and this is this is the benefit. This is the benefit of stereotypes. This is the benefit of these kind of caricatures, these false caricatures of a people, is that they don't speak English. You know, X, Y, or Z. Um, they are not actually U.S. citizens, or somehow they're um, they're suspect in some way. Uh, well, eighty percent of Latinxes are U.S. citizens. Um, so that's, that is a number that continues to grow because immigration numbers are, are going down. Now they're defining immigration in all different manners, whether it's done through a, the actual process or where uh, people were counted in the census who are undocumented. U.S. Latinxes who are immigrants on the decline, as I just said, only 24% of U.S. Latinxes of Mexican origins are foreign born. Now I talk about Mexican origin because they comprise the largest um, kind of subgroup within the Latinx uh, group in the United States at around 63%. So almost two thirds of all Latinxes are of Mexican origin, uh, but only 24% of those folks are foreign born, right? So again, I, I, I think these numbers are important to start with before I can even talk about how I analyze literature and why I think it's important. I think it's important for us to kind of consider the reality of these numbers and whatever we may have thought, um, whatever we may have heard on our favorite program, we need to kind of actually look into what the most recent uh, data is suggesting there. So, um, I think this is, I think it's fascinating for um, all of us who are um, involved in the pursuit of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge. So uh, implications here, um, and this is, this is just a little um, easy um, graph from, from that I just lifted from the Pew Research Center, easily found there. Uh, you, you, can, you can just see the trend lines. Um, and, and it doesn't seem to be um, wanting to move, right? So 
Uh, it is, as I, as I said, what, what are the implications here? It's hard to see how institutions, infrastructures, policies cannot be shaped by these numbers um, and these influences, um, especially in these areas that are um, of a concern and, and of importance when we're talking about um, uh, a Latinx presence, right? So it's one thing to talk about these numbers if you're in California, where the numbers of Latinos have been high for quite some time. But if we're talking about South Dakota, if we're talking about Virginia, we're talking about Utah, now the status quo is being upended and, and the way we do business at our universities, at our public schools, at, at our businesses, it's going to have to account for that because if you're not being proactive, if you're not proactively uh, considering this and planning for what's just around the corner, then you're, then you're only going to react. And then if you're reacting, uh, I'm speaking, you know, for, you know, uh, or as a member of the Latinx community, it will look like too little too late and you're just doing it to, to kind of ingratiate yourself to my community, but you don't actually mean it, right? So these are important things to deal with now. So what I've done is to just kind of, just briefly kind of paint a portrait of what this looks like in Utah and what this looks like in Virginia, right? So if we're looking at uh, institutions of higher education, uh, say in Virginia and in Utah, at, at VCU and at Utah State University, so the Utah System for Higher Education, we call it UCHI here. Um, it calls this phenomenon uh, Utah's growing opportunity gap, right? And what they have done is essentially mandate that all of the institutions under its purview, and my university is, is under that purview, the University of Utah, Southern Utah University, um, um, Utah Valley University, all these universities are, you know, they have been given mandates of where they should be recruiting their students and how they should be getting these particular demographics that are calling that opportunity gap. And, and I, I'll tell you, my university, is like running around, they're coming to me, like how can we get more Latinx students here? Because they know this is the future. And if they're not going to be able to get these students and to retain them, they're gonna go somewhere else. And, that, and that, that really strikes at the heart of the survival and the success of our institution, right? So um, th this, is, this is actually a real thing. It's not a, like, a, I'm not making things up here and saying, well, it could, no, this is an actual mandate that has come down from our, governing body, uh, our meaning institutions of higher education here in Utah. Um, so they predict that by 2065, the percent of people of color in Utah um, from the ages of 18 to 35 will double from where they are now. Um, and that kind of speaks to what I was saying before about the numbers like in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana showing there aren't a lot perhaps there, relatively speaking, but it's growing at an almost an exponential rate. Um, and so I took the liberty of just kind of looking at what's going on in Virginia. And the Virginia Latino Advisory Board states in their report, in their most recent report, that, quote, by 2030, uh, the number of Latinos in the state of Virginia will almost double from 9.8% to 17.2%. And it will comprise 79% of Virginia's growth that that is that is your future right so as i said as, as i tried to start you know my talk you know by by this kind of idea of like well why should why should we be concerned or why should it matter to you if you're not of this demographic and you don't really know you know you don't teach latinx literature you don't teach latinx history like why is this important because it these are the kind of raw realities that, that that we're all confronted with and last bullet point here in virginia latinos lag in high school grad rates you have the lowest of all the demographics there and you have the highest dropout rate um college degree completion is 32 percent latinx to 51 percent white you're not alone there there are a lot of these states where this is this is a, a burgeoning reality, where these numbers are very similar. Utah has a very similar kind of um, breakdown there, and we, and I'll speak for Utah, uh, we are are um, struggling to figure out how do we how do we get a, a handle on this because at one time, and I'll just stop here and just and just give you a little tidbit. Uh, I am I am friends with an alum of Utah State who is Latino. He is in his 70s. 
Um, he was in high school in the late 60s, early 70s. And he recalls being the only family in this area that was Latinx. And he is one of the first graduates of Utah State University uh, uh, who identified as uh, Latino. And so within his lifetime, we've gone from there to where we are now. And if we still have some folks who are kind of in that older model of, well, we really don't need to do anything about this, the numbers are so low, it's not that, it's not of a concern. These numbers uh, kind of like, kind of shoot that out of the water, right? So I, 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 I wanted to start with, with, with actual numbers, actual realities, and to, in, as I continue tonight, to connect these things to things like storytelling. So here's, here I am. Um, so my slide here, what I do and why I do it. Um, that's, that's a visual representation of my job as uh, to kind of ride this line. That's the Grand Canyon, by the way, if you didn't know. And just out of the frame is my wife, who's about to faint with our dog there because I got a little too close to the edge. But what you don't see there is that there's actually like a like a little like step just beyond the rock. So there's like a shelf. So it's not like a clear drop. Um, but I, I included this just one to kind of show a little bit of my weird sense of humor. But two, to kind of like, I, th I think that, you know, what I do and what a lot of us who are you know, working on these issues uh, kind of feel like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, where one time it was a struggle to just get people to listen to why you know, reading a novel by a black author or um, you know, a woman of color or a Latinx man is important. Uh, now we have uh, to deal with very political-minded folks who um, for reasons that you know, are not in good faith, don't want us to talk about what they, you know, underscore as critical race theory. So, so now we're like, oh, do we? What, what do I say? What, am I going to get in trouble? And so this is a this is um, I think an apt uh, visual for a lot of the work that those of us who are trying to create uh, more equitable and diverse and inclusive spaces for people sometimes feel like. Um, and, and that's what I do. Uh, in my scholarship, I'm trying to show why storytelling by Latinx is matters, why it's important and why it's necessary. Uh, I try to create spaces at my university for Latinx students um, and, and students who are not, but are interested in the culture to come to feel like they're welcome, to feel like they have a space, to feel like a part of the university belongs to them, is like home for them. Um, these spaces are crucial. Um, without these spaces, and I have had students that, that have told me, you know, at times they're the only Latinx face they see in all their classes and even in their, in their dorm room. And they feel homesick, they feel sad, and they don't want to stick around sometimes. They may be doing well, but they just, they're just not enjoying life. And yet we're confronted with the reality that I showed you before, which is, we need to retain, we need to recruit and retain Latinx students among other students, right? So these spaces matter. So I, so that's kind of what I do there. And then of course, as associate Dean, I'm always trying to create um, these, these kind of equitable uh, and diverse opportunities for these students who are, sometimes they don't have what they need um, uh, to be prepared. And we have to meet them where they are. We can't wish that they, we can't put them in a time machine and say, go learn this and come back. We have to work with the students that we have. So, um, and then of course, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm really interested in is storytelling. Uh, as Christina said at the opening, I'm a, a narrative theorist and I like to uh, kind of, you know, pop open the hood on narrative and kind of take it apart and see how it's um, doing what it does and why it's so important and why it's powerful. Um, and so I'm really interested in Latinx representation and storytelling. And I decided to kind of go with um, visuals because this is a presentation. I want to keep it kind of visually appealing. Um, you should understand that I also include um, you know, I'm also looking at novels, short stories, um, other forms of traditional uh, um, narrative art. But uh, for purposes of this 
uh, presentation, I, I thought I would you know include some images. So what we have here of, for uh, from a couple of years ago, we have Shakira and J Lo, um, uh, in you know at, as women who were not as young as they used to be, but still making me feel like I should move better than I do. Uh, I think at the time J Lo was fifty, uh, and I and I saw that and I said I I. I'm embarrassed. I I should be in better shape. Um, so I was very impressed by that, and that was at the Super Bowl halftime, right? Which is kind of like the one of the most watched events uh, in any given year. Um, and at the top, uh, we have Diego Luna, who is in uh, Rogue Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Um, I'm also very interested in how Latinx actors and characters appear in speculative spaces. As part of the uh, forthcoming books that I'm working on uh, are looking at that. I have a lot to say about that. I don't. I don't really have enough time to talk about it here. Here, other than to say that I find it very ironic that uh, the speculative, which is a large term that includes like horror, sci-fi, dystopia, you name it, these kind of speculative uh, storytelling modes, often are very constrained when it comes to I like real identities, right? So like and real like gender power dynamics and things like that so it takes forever to like have a woman who's a captain of a ship right or it takes forever to have like a latinx man or woman to be in charge of something in a sci-fi world where everything should be possible so i just find speculative um, narratives to be really interesting and they kind of reveal some things about how we conceive of storytelling in this country um, and then of course at the bottom we have uh, bottom right we have zoe saldana who um, tends to always, almost always, end up in makeup, which kind of kind of covers her, you know, uh, beautifully brown skin. Um, so she's, you know, Gamora there, and she's also in Avatar there, and kind of digital and prosthetic and and makeup. A um, couple more images for us. Um, a really well done representation of Latinx identity is a Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. There we see Miles Morales, who is a biracial. Uh, character um, in an alternate universe. He's Spider-Man. Um, if you haven't seen that film, it's really uh, worth your time. And then, of course, we have uh, Edward James Olmos in Blade Runner. Uh, again, he kind of has a bit part there in that in that classic film uh, with Harrison Ford, a uh, Ridley Scott film. Um, and it's interesting. He kind of has a pachuco look in that film, but he's his identity is really not kind of foregrounded as Latin, Latinx. It's He's just, he's kind of othered, right? He's, he's different, but he does have an interesting status in that film. And then of course the iconic uh, Cesar Romero, he, he was the first incarnation uh, of the Joker. Uh, there, is, uh, there he is, he, 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 is, he is one of these actors that kind of came up in the so-called Latin lover uh, type trope in Hollywood. Um, fascinating thing by uh, a story behind his characterization of the Joker is that uh, he refused to shave his mustache. Uh, and so he just painted over it. So you look closely, like his mustache is there, but he's got paint over it. Um, and, 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 and I could go on and on. My co-author, Frederick Lee Saldama, and I did this very activity um, in, our, in our latest book, Real Latinx's uh, representation in US television and film, where we surveyed all sorts of television and film and, and, and tried to give folks a quick understanding, a quick immersive experience to how the Latinx community has been represented good and problematic uh, in the history of Hollywood and in television. Um, so I'll move on here. Um, so I wanna talk about narrative here. Um, Narrative as a means of change. There, there's the cover to our to our book. There. Um, so, in narrative, there's a tendency, and, and as narratives are produced and uh, and as they proliferate, there's a tendency to repeat and to retain certain narratives, tropes, uh, narrative tropes, structures, and forms due to past success or acclaim. I, I call this kind of like a prisoner to success, right? Um, other people, you know, might describe it as just being very conservative um, in the non political sense, but just like uh, in terms of return on investment. That's why we see something that's a success in Hollywood tends to get replicated over and over, or we see Hollywood kind of goes back to something that's a really interesting film and does a remake of it. It tends to like to put its money in things that are 
bankable and reliable. And it's and as an industry, it's really not interested in in taking a risk. It's very risk averse. And so when you're talking about the history of Hollywood that is predominantly white, when are you ever going to see like a film like Black Panther? Right. Um, it takes so long to kind of get something like that. Uh, when are you ever going to see um, uh, other identities uh, represented in film, whether character or an actor? Right. So uh, narratives are important and, 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 and how they're um, allowed to be produced and exist uh, is of great concern. So this tendency that I'm talking about has the effect of shunting or preventing other narratives from proliferation or existence. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And then further, this tendency is motivated and reinforced by markets and capitalism, which I was talking about before. Like these are money-making enterprises and they're risk averse. I'll just repeat that. They, they, they don't want to take a chance. So often this is where you see breakthroughs in like independent film, kind of like the, you know, kind of do it yourself filmmaking, like um, Robert Rodriguez, right? Like he does El Mariachi. He basically rents, uh, checks out film equipment from his program that he was at at the University of Texas at Austin, um, uses it for like a weekend, several days, and he films most of El Mariachi, which is just like, it's, you know, it's just, it's this wonderful film, but it really kind of launched him. He had to kind of do it himself, right? Um, if he was waiting around to be kind of taken in by, you know, the Hollywood executives, I mean, he might still be waiting, right? So sometimes there, there, there have to be interventions and they have to be kind of self-driven. These systemic infrastructures effectively create barriers of exclusion. They often uphold the status quo. So you can see where I'm going here. And they squelch creativity and artistic pursuits by and about underrepresented communities. So this is not accidental. See, when I was coming up, I used to wonder why I didn't see a lot more Latinos in film. I used to wonder why I didn't read a lot more stories by Latinos in my English classes. And what happened was I intuited that what, what it must mean is that my community is not good at telling stories, which is, which is false, right? Um, but, it, but as I you know, got older and I you know, went through grad school and you know, more research, I understand that these are very intentional ways of producing storytelling that excludes certain groups and certain kinds of stories. That's why I got the idea of like, there are narratives that are permissible and some that are not. And there are people who control those things and it matters and we need to talk about those things. So we'll talk about how Latinxes are situated within my interest in, in storytelling. So as my title suggested, I wanna talk briefly about Latinx precarity. Um, and this is from Judith Butler. She says, the politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social economic networks of support and become differentially exposed to injury, violence, and death. This is this is this is precarity, right? And um, there there are many communities that are affected by this. But today I'm talking about Latinx communities. And um, what does this look like? Uh, what kind of forms does it take? Well, it takes many forms. It is very divergent. It is very intersectional. So just as the Latinx community is very intersectional and very diverse. Precarity is also very different too. There might be, um, uh, you know, someone who is of Afro-Latino descent might have a different kind of precarity than a Latina who is blonde-haired and fair-skinned. So, uh, uh, for example, um, precarity may may appear passive. It may not look like anything is actually, you know, you know, holding back um, or or actively against. Uh, the Latinx community, but it's it can be very insidious precisely because it seems to be, and it is, systemic. So for many people, it just seems like that's just the way it is uh, when they don't realize that systems are created by, by societies and by people and by laws. Um, it is tethered to systemic and social policies that don't consider mitigating factors that disenfranchise Latinx people. So there's another side to this is like those of us who are implementing and, 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 and continuing these kinds of policies, procedures, perhaps at the university, like we're actually participating in this kind of putting this particular group in a precarious situation. Um, it, uh, what does it look like? It is, the, um, it is the omission or myopic expression of representative examples of Latinx culture, such as in stereotypes, um, uh, in folkloric and narrative traditions. Like there's only one way of being Latinx, 
right? And we see it over and over again in certain, you know, kind of narrative expressions. It may concern other things such as food scarcity, economic hardship, suspicion of institutions, fear of or disinterest in higher education. All of these things are pinging about in the Latinx community. And it forces Latinxes to give up on pursuits that they are not immediately tied to, um, uh, to the economic security of the family. So in other words, uh, if we're talking about a family and we have a, we have a child who's thinking about higher education, maybe getting a college, um, how is that going to help put food on the table right now? How is that going to help the family coffers now? Right? So that, that, Long term, that's a bad decision, but and that's where the precarity comes from. But for a lot of families, it's like, well, I would I would rather my child who may not even graduate high school, but now he can work, go get a job making twenty dollars an hour and help the family. Um, they're actually participating in their own potential uh, demise as time goes on. So narrative permissibility. I've just briefly mentioned that. It's a quote from my book: narratives can flourish in the minds of audiences only if they are deemed permissible. Uh, I think this, this has a lot of implications for what, um, what, what we do with this body of, of work. So the concepts I wanna put forward are not only permissibility, but this idea of gatekeeping. So some questions, I'm running, you know, sand is going through the hourglass here. So, but I'm putting these questions, I'm happy to kind of come back to some of my ideas on these, but who endows permissibility to these narratives and the narratives that we purchase, we encounter, we disseminate, we read, we assign, are all narratives granted the same levels of permissibility? I think the answer to that is no, an emphatic no. Uh, and then the next question is why and why not? Why are some Latinx narratives published while others are not? And this kind of speaks to, hey, the market likes cartel narratives. The market likes crossing the border narratives, but as you'll see, if I have time, it doesn't. It's not interested in like my life story, which I'm not an immigrant, and my family. I have to go a long way back to find a time where my family crossed the border. Um, why do paradigmatic and syntagmatic considerations of narrative matter in this discussion? Because someone's going to say, well, you know, there's an aesthetic quality to narratives. So it's either good or it's not. Well, that's the that's the uh, syntagmatic stuff, right? That's the syntax of storytelling, as, as we say, right? But paradigms are, are, are like snapshots in time. What works at this moment may not work later on, but when we consider that the market of storytelling is very risk averse, it wants to continue to replicate itself over and over and over again. How do markets shape these forces? How do scholars and educators influence this sort of gatekeeping? And then the most important question of all for me that keeps me up at night is who can write certain stories and who cannot? And of course, why? So persistence, I'm coming to my close here. I wanna talk about persistence of effort, right? It's extraordinarily difficult to break through these, these paradigms I'm talking about um, because they make money. Um, but the Latino demographic that has more money to spend is also growing and they're not really buying these kinds of stereotypical, like for example, I have costumes here that you can buy on Amazon still, right? Um, and it's not simply about quality. That's kind of a red herring. It's, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, it's, it's what I used to believe that Latinos just weren't good enough writers. It's hard to write literature when you and your family are working in a, in a field of crops that you have to work. Like, how are you gonna write? Right? So that's like this kind of privilege that comes with being able to write. Uh, though Latinx narratives have begun to proliferate and we're seeing more of them, more representation, they're still, you know, unfortunately, they're very narrow in scope and vision. They're rarely speculative, as I said, which I find just fascinating. I'm just going to leave you with two brief examples to illustrate what I'm saying, and then I will turn to questions. So case study one is I'm not Reina Grande. If you know who Reina Grande is, She's a wonderful writer. She, um, uh, uh, the distance between us, she talks about her, like her journey crossing the border. Her father came to the United States and she like, like was torn that he was gone. And she actually went as a child to go search for him. Um, so this is, this actually happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. I was contacted uh, to see if I would be willing and interested in writing a book about Mexican American history to young readers. And, and this was an imprint that was of, of one of the big five. I won't say which one, but it was, it was a big, it was a big deal. And I was like, okay, yeah. So they wanted me to write a sample. And I just wrote a sample. There's a little bit of what I did. It's just the opening paragraph of my two page sample. 
And then I found out yesterday that they hired someone else. And they were like, you know, thanks, but we hired someone else. Well, they hired Reina Grande. <laughs> so like, that's cool. I'm like, you know, you know, the bad news is I didn't get it. The good news is they hired Reina Grande. Um, and so in this case, like Reina Grande, she's, she's established writer of narrative. You know what I mean? And she's an immigrant and she's a well-established name. And I'm not saying I could have written a better book than her, right? But what I will say that for market considerations, she's, she's proven. Like she's an award-winning writer. She's got a great story. She's got name brand recognition. That big five uh, publisher is going to be like, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of who we want to go with, right? So that's, that's case study one, how this operates in real life, and I can speak to it. The second is this memoir that I've, I've written. No one wants it. You know, poor me. And, uh, you, know, and I, you know, big scary brown guy is my title, right? Um, so I've been trying to publish this memoir for a while. And when it gets rejected, I work on it a little bit more and I think I improve it. But see, I'm trying to create a new niche, which is the Latinx academic, right? Uh, not like Richard Rodriguez, right? But like, um, like he has this you know, wonderful story about, you know, and it's controversial as well about kind of like, you know, did he kind of like kind of leave his culture behind or whatever? Like, I'm not an immigrant. Like, as I said, and I have a totally different story. And as, a, as the data suggests, most Latinxes in the United States are not immigrants either, right? Uh, but on multiple occasions, I've had over 20 agents say, ah, oh, I wanna see this and, because I query them, but then they reject it, <laughs> right? And here's the last rejection I got just a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can read it there. Uh, basically, she says, I love your voice. I love what you're doing, but memoirs are hard to sell, right? And you have to be really, almost you have to be a celebrity or you have to be a well-known writer. And then here's the kicker. She says, I was hoping I could make it work anyway, but ultimately I was shot down. And then she said, a little bit of encouragement. Still, I say, keep writing, keep submitting. The right publisher for you is out there. I know it. But that she said, you know, and she's like the acquisitions editor. She was like, I want this. But the board above her said, we can't sell this because there's no market that exists for this, right? So this is like, an, like a real world example of what I'm talking about. So in closing, uh, there's Oscar Isaac. Um, he's one of my heroes. Everything that he's in is like, now I, I have to write about it. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, when it comes to the Latinx community. Uh, Lat Latinx is embody a specific kind of precarity and that lack of representation in creative media uh, uh, venues is a part of it. Latinxes have a more difficult time in getting narrative permissibility, as I just demonstrated, which affects precarity, right? And then narrative permissibility, in part, helps efforts to increase persistence of Latinxes writ large. Like, we, we need more stories by all sorts of Latinxes, right? Like, like more Latino stories, the more we kind of understand it's expansive, we, we don't have the kind of narrow-minded focus of that, and the better off we are. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the questions. Hope I didn't go over too much. Wonderful. No, no, this is perfect. Um, we can we can close the. Um, uh, thank Stop you very share. much, and we can go to questions. There are four comments or questions in the Q and A, um, and um, you know I'd like to invite you to keep them coming. We have about 10, 15 more minutes, and if you'd like to raise your hand, I can also unmute you. Um, I will start with Vivian Medina Messner's comment, uh, just acknowledging that many Latinos, Latinas are tired of cartel narratives, right? As you were, you were suggesting. <laughs> um, yeah. Oswaldo, um, would, if you'd like to, um, to ask your question live, we can do that. Uh, if not, I can just read it for you. And then if you have a follow-up, we can go to you. Um, so Oswaldo asks, how do you see your work um, and Latinx representation translate to Latinxes in other areas like Virginia as intersectional beings? Thank you, Oswaldo, for that. Um, I think it's a really good question. And I think what your question kind of underscores is that the, the Latinos, Latinxes in Utah are gonna have a different set of concerns than those in Virginia. They're gonna have a different set of concerns than those in Florida and so forth. Part of the reason is that Latinxes are so diverse. It could be from Mexico, it could be from Cuba, it could be Puerto Rico, it could be, I mean, you name it. And all of them have different kind of traditions, cultures, 
and but they're like lumped into this one kind of thing. The other thing too is that, as I suggested, there are some Latinxes that are that have the immigrant kind of mindset, very fresh, and then there are some like my family that are like, like that hasn't been a concern for a very very long time. I, I mean, I'm from Texas, and if like there were there were there were brown people in Texas a long time ago before it was even Mexico even. So, um, so I, I think, you know, the kind of the straightforward question or answer to your question, Oswaldo, is that um, there is going to be some translation. There is going to be some commonality. And, the, and where, where you're going to find commonality is in things like access to higher education, access to resources, access to healthcare. care. Um, there's going to be a shared kind of experience there. And so that's why these kinds of things have to be discussed and we have to kind of think um, we have to think about creating programs. You have to think about making actual interventions because it's one thing to create a task force. Let's make a task force to see what this problem is, but then nothing gets done. Uh, on the other hand, like why don't create? Why don't we create? Uh, you know, in like in my in my area, we created like a um, a foundation that really raises money for scholarships because time and time again, one of the biggest barriers for Latinx students is that they don't have the money. And they have a hard time telling their parents, uh, I'm going to go to the university and I'm going to have to spend money to get a degree that may not guarantee me a job when the, when the parents like, well, you could work where I'm working for $20 an hour tomorrow with a thousand dollar signing bonus. Right. So that that's happening right now, especially after COVID, like it's hard to hire people um, be, because, you know, people are starting to like jack up the wages that they're that they're offering. So I think there, there are some common ground. But I think it's important to remember that we, how we're coming to this common table and why by we, I mean Latinxes, how we're how we got there might be different. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Victor Clark, are you still um, are you still around? I could um, allow you to I just gave you permission to talk if you'd like to ask your question live. Sure, I'm here. Um, yeah, so I wanted to know if you believe that there's gatekeeping that takes place within the Latinx communities um, that creates barriers to dismantling gatekeeping outside of the Latinx communities, um, specifically in academia. And then how do you think we can do a better job of unifying and celebrating the plethora of Latinx experiences rather than competing for the one authentic or franchised Latinx experience? Victor, that is a, that is a, Ooh, that is a question that is dogging many of us, uh, and I see it here. Um, you know, when I came here, and I and I and I partnered with the the president of the university here at Utah State to create a Latinx cultural center. Uh, suddenly, I felt that there were um, organizations that that should have been allies, that should have been wanting to kind of partner with us, that wanted really they really wanted nothing to do with us, and it was like their thing, like they had their thing and their resources and they didn't want to either share them or potentially lose their resources because now we were in existence. Uh, so that's one thing. Two is in academia, that happens a lot. It's like, and it's, it's not just in the Latinx community, it, it is in almost probably in every, you know, discipline or field where like some people think that they're doing the real work. Right. And what you're doing is just not important. And when I was coming up, I, I, I remember hearing professors in grad school saying, well, you know, why are you studying narrative? Like what you need to do is like take it to the streets. Like that's the real work. And, you know, I thought, well, but this is important, too. Like there are many different ways of doing what we need to do. It's a huge problem and we can all take a bite of it. Um, and then and then so so that's a problem. And then thirdly, I would say, you know, there is this problem of you, you know, you, you kind of call it authentic. I think it's a good word for it, but like, who is a real Latinx? Who's a real Latina? Who's a real Latino? Um, my daughters are, are they're Latino, Latina, and they're white. So their mother is white and they have the surname Gonzalez, but when they go to school, sometimes they are considered white by their Latina friends. And sometimes they're considered brown by their white friends. And they, like, they don't know, like, well, 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 what am I, right? Because they feel like there's this test, like they don't speak Spanish well enough. They don't have as brown skin as I've got. So therefore they're not real. 
right? They're not authentically like, and, and, and it bothers them because they want to claim that, but they, but they get this pressure. So, you know, finally, what I'll just say is like, there's this phenomenon that, that has been quoted often and is always important to hear it, which is, you know, this, is this metaphor of the crabs in the bucket. So they have all these crabs in a bucket. One crab will eventually try to get out and then some other crab will pull it back down. What we want to do is uplift. What we don't want to do is bring someone else down because there are all manner of ways of attacking this problem, of making things better. And if, and if, and if we're not working in synergy, then like it's very easy for those not in the community to say, look, you guys can't even get your act together. Well, you know, first get your act, because that's a criticism you always hear. Like when we talk about Black Lives Matter, you know, some people will say, oh, but look at all of the black on black crime in Chicago. Right. And the, the, so it's also this what, what about ism. And that's what happens to us. I say, well, you know, why, why should we even worry about you? Because you guys can't even get your act together. So it takes solidarity. It takes working together and understanding that there are a lot of ways to attack this problem. Thank you for that question. Wonderful. Thank you, Victor. And thank you, Chris, for your answer. Um, we have um, two more questions. Um, and <laughs> I will give Antonio. Um, the floor if I can get to you. <laughs> Antonio, I did not ask Antonio to ask this question, but he is asking the question that has been on my mind. And Antonio is in history, I'm in English. And, you know, I think we can apply this, um, you know, across, across um, institutional um, departments. So um, Antonio, if you're still here, would you like to ask your question live? Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Christopher for an excellent uh, presentation. It's wonderful to hear uh, from an, a fellow uh, Latinx and also uh, uh, to hear about all of his experience and the different ways to, as he say, uh, try to address the challenges to our community. In a, in a solidary way, right? And my question is about something that perhaps you have faced in your own experience. And it has to do with the difficulty to convince uh, the university's administration to uh, carry uh, effective change in the sense of creating true equity. Uh, an equity uh, or an, an effort that equity that is not just performative, but actual, right? And uh, in, in, in my personal concern is the lack of uh, uh, Latinx leadership, right? At VCU, uh, we don't really have uh, Latinx leaders, uh, despite the fact that there are so many qualified uh, professionals out there. Uh, and it's also hard to convince administration sometimes to hire more Latinx faculty because I understand we are going through a period of perceived lack of resources. So how to face those challenges is my question. Yeah, thank you, Antonio, for that, for that uh, really important question. Um, <clears throat> the cynical part of me is to say, you know, money talks. And for a lot of administrators and leaders of the university, it's about money. It's about, it's about, and that means enrollment, right? And so, you know, what I would say is, you know, look at, look at Virginia's numbers. I mean, that was easy for me to find. And I'm sure in Virginia, you have even more numbers that you can kind of get to, but the numbers show like the trend is there are going to be more and more uh, Latinx students that are of age that, that, that are potentially coming to the university um, but there have to be interventions to those students because they're, they're, they're clearly not getting the resources they need in secondary. I know that sounds bad. I mean, I used to be a high school teacher. My wife is a high school teacher now, um, but you know, it's, it's a struggle for them. But I would just say that more of, of your university students are going to be the Latinx in the next 10 years or so. It is, it's just going to happen. And you're going to need those students because they're going to decide to go to a different university. And we know that since we're talking about Latinx students, they will, they're much more apt to go to a university where they see faculty that look like them and that have similar experiences to them. And so like right there, you need, like that is why you need, like your faculty at your university, 
ideally, and this is at every university, it should mirror, it should mirror the demographic breakdown of your state. So, right, like we were just looking at the numbers of Virginia, like that's the percentages of Latinx faculty you, your, your departments should be shooting for. And if they're not, then that's then is a problem. And 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 they're and they're they're now gonna have to react rather than having done something about it 15 years ago. Like they say, when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, 15 years ago, if you can't, you better plant it today, right? And so, so, so that's one concern. And the last thing I'll say, Antonio, is your university, my university, other universities that are facing this, this crisis, you, they have to uh, uh, nurture and encourage, in this case, Latinx faculty into leadership roles, right? So there have to be opportunities for being department head, for being the director of a program, for starting a program, for being an associate dean, being on the path to being a vice president, because that's where the, the change really happens. As, a, and as someone who is in administration now, I guarantee you, I bring perspectives and, and ways of looking at these problems that, that my colleagues have not considered because it's not the work they do and it's not the experiences that they've had. So, um, so, I, so I, like, how do you convince? Well, I always tell everyone here, the survival of this university is, is dependent on the success in recruiting and retaining Latinx students. It's, it's, it, that's, that's just the way it is. And it's, it's inexorable. And I, and my sense is that, 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 I mean, look at the numbers nationally, that's every university, because now you're in competition with other things that, that high school students who might go to college can do, right? So now you have to like, you have to actively recruit. How are you gonna recruit students who step onto the campus and they see nothing that reflects their, their culture? Like, why would they go there? Why wouldn't they go somewhere that they feel comfortable with? That's the problem we have at Utah State. A lot of Latinx students would rather go to, you know, universe, uh, uh, Utah Valley University. We have a, a, a very diverse, high, percentage of Latinx is, and that's like the center of gravity over there for Latinx students. And it's hard to get them to come up here. We're in Northern Utah. It's hard to get them to come up here because they see this as very non-Latino friendly. So we're we're trying to, to, to do something, but even I feel we're behind. So it's probably a good guess that you guys are kind of, you know, you, got, you, you, know, you, you need to jumpstart this. Um, and I'm happy to continue this conversation with you all after the meeting. Uh, stay in touch. I'm happy to brainstorm with you. Wonderful. Uh, before we go to our last question, I just wanted to um, say that Fabi Hilmes says that um, she would love to read your memoir. So you already have a reader. <laughs> even though the, <laughs> even I'm going to tell the novel, my next the, uh, acquisitions editor, I already have one person who wants to read it. <laughs> the memoir is not published yet, but you have, um, you have won some hearts here. Oh. Uh, we have one last question from uh, Miriam Kadeba, who is our fabulous director of OMSA, our Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. Uh, Miriam, I, um, if you're still here, you can go ahead and ask the question yourself hi hi Christina hi. thank you so much good to, see you. Um, good to see you as well what a lovely event this was this has been really fantastic so I just wanted to say thank you again um and my question is um I think pretty similar to what Antonio asked um just previously and it was really related to um, wanting to inquire and see if you could speak to some of the institutional barriers that you might have encountered within your work at the university level when working to support uh, Latinx and Hispanic students and ways that you may have been addressing these barriers. This is something that um, at the Office of Multicultural Student Affairs, like we're hoping to just continue to tackle and wanted to see if you had any insight that you could share. Thank you in advance. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. That's a it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I've experienced many, uh, I, more than I can explain here. Um, but I just give you kind of a snapshot. Um, so before I was at Utah State University, I was at one of the regional campuses of Texas A and M University. Uh, there's there's a campus near Dallas. It's called uh, called Texas A and M Commerce. That's the town that it's in. And um, that university is on track to be a Hispanic serving institution. It will, it will be there uh, within a few years, I think. Um, 
But when I was there, that was my first tenure track job out of graduate school. Um, I wanted to do more for Latinx students because I remember what it was like for me in my experience and what I would have wished that I could have had. Um, like I like I wanted more uh, formally kind of pro like programmed um, opportunities for mentorship, for training, for workshops, rather than what happened to me, which was very like accidental like mentors. I had great mentors, but I just like I just crossed paths with them one day, and it was that that like, were my mentor. Um, and I wonder what would have happened had I not accidentally met up with that person. So I was trying to do this there, and. I, I would have these conversations with upper administration. I got to the president at one point. I had a meeting with the president at the time. And I said, look, this is why we need to create these programs. And like, we need this. And he said, this is, this is great. It's great news. This would be wonderful. He's like, unfortunately, we don't have money. Like, and that was it. Like, he was like, we don't have money. But the longer I have been in higher education and the higher up in the hierarchy that I've gone, the more I know that there is money. See, there is money, but it's usually allocated for some other initiative or something else. And so you're having to kind of convince people, like, why is this an investment that should be made? I'm fortunate at my university because I have a president, a university president who, like, it's one of her presidential, like, priorities to do more for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's one of the reasons I came to this university. And within one year, we had established a Latinx cultural center, like one year. And people were like, how did you do that so fast? I said, I had a president who's, who wants to put her money where her mouth is, right? So, um, so, but, but, so that was a barrier where I was. And I happened to go somewhere where there was more opportunity there. But, but even while here, that you, you know, you always hear, or I always hear, um, you know, critics say, well, why do Latinx students need their own space, right? The whole university is their space. Right. And isn't that segregating them? Isn't that you know, they always try to come up with these weird kind of ways of like trying to undermine what you're trying to do. And what I always tell them is that, no, it's like when you go somewhere where no one looks like you, you you will feel it psychologically and you will at one point or another question why you're even there. And so, as I said before, you know, in the situation that you guys are in and the one I'm in, I'm always tying these efforts to the numbers, to the demographics, the growing demographic, and the future of your university. The future of your university and my university here is, is tied. You, like, you, like, it, it's like handcuffed to Latinx students. If they succeed, the university will succeed. But they won't succeed on their own because there's been this systemic problem of whether it's cultural or whether it's, you know, you know, the, you know, uh, public school systems that are, you know, kind of perhaps marginalized or don't provide resources. Like that means the university has to invest and has to like spend money, but, they, but you have to spend money to make money. Right. It, I mean, it's a business. I mean, let's talk about it like that. Let's talk about it like it is. Let's 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 talk about truth here. And so that's how you have to talk to administrators. Like this is within like, this is about money and this is about numbers. And this is like, this is the way forward. And if, and if you wait five or 10 years to hire a Latinx faculty, if you wait 15 years to get a Dean who's, a, who's, who's Latinx, it's too late. Like it's almost too late because those people will go somewhere else where they're wanted and needed. Right. So like, I, I don't know how to say it. Like, I wish I could talk to your administrators because I think I made a persuasive case for why they need to do this. It's in, it's, 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 their, it's in their own self-interest as an institution to do this. Amen to oh, that. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Chris. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of time a long time ago now, but I'm so <laughs> grateful to you for sticking around, uh, Chris, and for taking all the questions. And to all of you in the audience who are still here, faithfully here. So thank you, Professor Gonzalez. And I look forward to continuing this conversation in different um, other uh, venues. And uh, to those of you who are still here, I just wanted to say, please mark your calendars for our next event in this um, HRC speaker series uh, for November the 11th at 6 p.m. when we'll welcome um, internationally renowned activist and scholar of indigenous history, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. Professor Ortiz will speak about her recent book um, called Not a Nation of Immigrants, 
settler colonialism, white supremacy, and the history of erasure and exclusion. And as I usually say in my emails, come one, come all, and tell your students. Uh, one last thing, one last pitch, because I have to do this. Tomorrow, Friday at noon, we will hold our third event of the semester in the series um, Re HRC Research Fridays. And tomorrow we are lucky to have Dr. Archana Pathak, who will speak about mentoring underrepresented faculty, especially in the humanities and social sciences. And we hope to see many of you and your students at these and future events. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Thank you uh, again, Professor Gonzalez, for being with us tonight and have a good night. Thank you.